Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. We went from controlling our own destiny, doing whatever we wanted, to basically having Micron come in and change every HR policy and tighten everything down and had to report to the street. And every quarter, the CEO would come in from Boise, Idaho and say, okay, Now everything's changed. We're going after dedicated web hosting. And then the next quarter would be like, forget dedicated web hosting. The street wants application server processing. I mean, it was just every single quarter, it was something different. And being a 27-year-old, I had no idea what to even do with myself in that situation. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. So welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. Today I interviewed Jeremy Young. Jeremy sold his first business for $22 million to what now is known as Bout.com. He sold his second business for $50 million to what is today called Web.com. And he's continued to have success as a serial entrepreneur. We're going to jump in and talk about these today. Jeremy's current business, Tanga, is a daily deal website that did over $24 million in revenue last year. So I'm very excited to have you on the show today and talk about your journey to seven figures. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, so real quick, so people know the current business, Tanga is kind of like the Groupon, like daily deals where it's like, it's a daily deal and you just drive a ton of traffic to an offer, right? That's right. Yeah. We're thinking of this as a marketplace for deal seekers. Groupon meets Amazon meets Overstock. Okay. Awesome. So there, I know there's like some amazing stories behind that. We're even having to cut out some of the businesses we're going to talk about today because you have so many of them, but Let's jump back to like the first real business virtual servers back in 96. Can you tell us like how you came up with this idea and how you got started? Yeah, absolutely. I had a company that I was working with that developed some of the first e-commerce sites and systems and shopping cart engines for e-commerce. And so we were basically paying a web hosting company every single month. And I really loved that business model of, of that reoccurring revenue. And so I approached them and said, hey, if I started another business, would you white label your services for me and kind of let me rebrand your services into my own, where for all intents and purposes, no one would know that we were reselling. And so they created that program for us and we were able to quickly grow that business. And so it was really cool because we went from not making any money. And the first time we sold a web hosting product, we were actually profitable because we had no expenses, right? Mm -hmm. We were working out of our college dorms and college apartments. And so literally no expenses. And so we made money almost from day one. Mm, very cool. So you took this product like this, where you're able to white label it. How do you then go out and like start having some success with that? Because obviously, maybe back then it wasn't a super competitive space, but that could be considered a very commoditized service these days. Yeah, back then it wasn't. We had some unique technology called virtual servers. And so there were only a handful of companies that were offering it. Now that's what everybody offers. But back then, you know, we had to hack the Unix kernel basically to create these virtual servers. So it basically gave people the power of a dedicated server on a lower price point shared server platform. But the way that we grew it is I had a business partner who registered a domain name, windows95.com before Microsoft did. Mm-hmm. And so he created a web platform that allowed people to download software, shareware, drivers. It was kind of a community of Windows lovers. And I don't know if you remember, but back in Windows 95 days, Microsoft didn't even have a web browser in their operating system. So they weren't even thinking about the internet back then. So Steve was pretty smart registering that domain name. He eventually mm-hmm. sold that business to CNET for $12 million. Mm-hmm. So he had a pretty nice exit with that. But Steve was my business partner. And then he would advertise the virtual servers on Windows95.com and drive a huge amount of traffic over to our website. And so we were able to grow very, very quickly. And it really grew to a $50 million sale in about three and a half years. Wow. Do you know how many visitors he was getting a month to his site? It was millions. I don't, I don't remember. I mean, this is 20 years ago, so I don't remember the exact amount, yeah. but millions of people. Okay. And then so he just started advertising this like service that you guys have. People start buying. Did it pretty much just grow pretty quickly from there? Or were there some different steps or breakthroughs that you had? Yeah, that was our main driver of sales. But, you know, as you grow the amount of churn that you have at, let's say, three or 4% a month, started to come up to the point where we weren't growing anymore. 
And so we had to come up with different ways of growing the company. One of the things that we did was create what we called media properties internally. But what that was is different things for consumers to visit, different business tools for people that would get them engaged and then we could advertise to them. So one of them was called Domain Valet. And at one point, Domain Valet was registering hundreds of thousands of domains for network solutions back when they had the monopoly for domain registration. So we were one of the larger partners for network solutions. Millions and millions of domain names were registered through us. And what we would do is once they would register the domain name, we would then market to them our web hosting product, kind of like what GoDaddy and Enom or some of these others do now. Unfortunately, when Micron purchased our, our company, they kind of threw that under the bus and they could have developed a billion dollar company just with what we had going with Domain Valet. But unfortunately, they were a little short-sighted with that. Mm. So you guys created that as just like another way to get in front of like the people that could become customers for you? That's exactly right. Yeah. And we had Git search. And so we would automatically submit people's websites to hundreds of different search engines. We had Git fonts where we had thousands of different fonts people could download. And so all of these different properties, I think we had four or five, would then drive traffic back to our core business to allow us to scale up even more. And were these, were you mainly getting traffic to those sites through like search engine optimization? Yeah, through search engine optimization and also just people who would come to the vServer website would see our other properties and word of mouth, obviously. You know, we offered these domain services for free. And so there weren't a lot of people doing it back then. We kind of had a little bit of a, a monopoly, which is kind of nice. Hmm. So I think there's probably some good lessons in there as far as like an SEO, you talk about like what kind of asset do you have where people are going to want to link to it, refer to it. And it sounds like you created multiple of these, like domain registration, be able to get fonts. Like, did, Were you guys pretty strategic about coming up with those ideas or, did, or how did you come about those? Not really. You know, my, I'm more of a kind of throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. And so we didn't have big business plans. We just thought, hey, this is what people need. Let's develop a website around it. And we'd, we'd get it done pretty quickly. So not a lot of cost to develop these things. And if they started to scale and produce results, we would put more time and energy on it. Mm, interesting. Cool. All right. So you started adding those in. I believe that I saw you guys did about 11 million in sales with this company. Is that what got you there? Was this Windows95.com partnership and then those other like resources? Yeah. Windows95 was the first step to get us there. We probably you know, generated 7 or $8 million of annual revenue for us. And then the other things after that, the domain valet and the Git search and things like that would probably contributed to most of the rest. But really, up until CNET purchased Windows95.com back in 1998, maybe. And then we actually had an advertising partnership with CNET for about a year and a half. So they continued to drive traffic and help us acquire customers up to the sale to Micron back in December of 99. Hmm. Very interesting. So we're going to be talking like about some of your different businesses and talking about some of these highlights. But I would love like one interesting thing here is obviously you found an amazing partner that helped get you to seven or eight million because they had so much traffic. How do you go about finding good partners? And we could talk about this with maybe some of your future companies, or maybe you could share some of your ideas on this. Sure. For me, it's just been people that I've known and we've just got along really well. So for example, my current one of my current partners, Matt Mullen, I've worked with in every single one of my businesses over the past 20 plus years. And so we work really well together. We know how each other think. We trust each other. And so finding people that you've worked with in the past is probably the best way to go about it because you know how they work under certain situations, stressful situations, good times, bad times. And so with Steve, we had met when I was teaching an HTML design course in college. So he just needed a half a credit to get an MBA. And so he came into my class already knowing how to program, obviously. And so we became friends. And, and so he was a partner for, for a good four years. And then we teamed up with another group called Light Realm in Seattle during that time. And Lynn Castle, who was CEO of that company, we've been working together and been friends for 20 plus years since. And we still try to figure out ways we can work together. So I, I think for me, it's just finding people that, that I've had previous success with and that I trust and we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And then so virtual servers, you built that to like 11 million and then you sold it for $50 million to Micron Electronics in December 99. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. So maybe you want to talk to us through that. I think a lot of listeners probably are, you know, they, they know they want to grow a business to sell, but they probably don't know how you would do that. Do you, do you remember like how you went about going to like sell that company? 
It was all by chance, actually. So Steve Jenkins had a friend from college in his MBA program that was in a taxi line in New York City. And a man named Lorian Gable, who was hired by Micron to find assets to purchase, was talking to this guy in a taxi line. And the guy said, hey, have you heard of V-Servers out of Seattle? And Lorian didn't. And that was probably in the summer of 99. And so we got a call from Lorian. And within a couple of months, they were giving us an LOI. And we sold very quickly. I think the whole transaction only took three or four months. Wow. But Micron was doing a roll-up at the time. So they purchased, I think, four different web hosting companies. And so they they purchased one out of Boise, out of LA, out of Atlanta, and then the ours in Seattle and rolled them up. Mm, very interesting. Okay, cool. Do you want to jump in? There's a couple more businesses, but do you want to jump ahead to Uberplay, which was in 2003? Yeah. So after I was done with V servers, I was introduced to some board games by one of my employees and good friend, Blise Francois. And so some of these games were from Germany. And so if you've ever played any of the German games like Ticket to Ride or Settlers of Catan, Carcassonne, you know, these games were pretty unique back in the day. In fact, the games that we played weren't even in English. They were actually in German. Mm. So the, the cards were in German. But I immediately fell in love with the, the idea of these kind of Euro-style German games. I'm sure most of your audience has heard of Settlers of Catan, which is probably the biggest. And so I basically just flew to Germany during a big board game conference called the, the Spiel Essen. And got to know all the big game designers, all the big publishers, graphic artists, producers, and really threw myself into the business thinking that I could take a lot of these cool board games from Germany that have sold millions of copies, translate them in English, produce them in China, and start that kind of board game culture here in the United States. And so that's how I started Uberplay. Very interesting. So you went to this conference and you made a lot of these connections. And then did you start like doing like licensing deals with people right away? We did. Yeah, it didn't take very long at all. In fact, so the author of Settlers of Catan, his name is Klaus Teuber. Guido is his son, and he was getting an MBA at George Washington University. So and when we connected, we became really good friends. And so Guido, myself, and then Matt Mullen, who is my current CMO, we, we started this board game company together. Mm. And so I had access to Guido's father's designs, and Guido knew everybody in the industry. So it was very easy to network into Alan Moon and Aaron Weisblum and Reiner Knizia and all of these huge board game designers that had a lot of success over in Germany. And you met this guy at this conference? I did. Yep. Cool. And then was there anything you did to kind of build that relationship with him quickly where he was interested in working with you guys? Yeah. You know, I think the success I had with my previous business landed a lot of credibility for me. I was self-financing it. And so we were able to get out the gates really quickly. We could license the design and get an artist to produce the graphics and get the board game printed very, very quickly within months. And so I think he he was pretty excited about the idea of trying to turn the United States into a board game culture like Germany currently is. And so, yeah, we just connected on a personal level. He's still just one of the greatest guys I know. He actually lives in Oakland with his wife and he's in charge of all of his father's Catan properties worldwide kind of manages the business side of the the business for his father. Mm. Okay, cool. So like with uh, with the games, how did you know which ones would be good to sell and which ones wouldn't? Yeah, that's the hardest part, right? You, <laughs> <laughs> these board game companies are kind of reliant on having a huge hit. And so we never got that huge hit. Unfortunately, Settlers of Catan was already licensed out to a company. So we couldn't get that license. We tried a few different types of versions of Catan. And so one of the, the companies that you didn't mention is, is we also started a company called Simply Fun. It still exists. It operates out of Bellevue, Washington. It's a party plan company, a MLM, basically, like Pampered Chef. And we actually raised $7 million total, I believe, in that company. And we, we thought this would be a really good way of distributing games because that's how people typically buy games. As you go to someone's house, you play a fun game. And then you go and purchase it. You typically don't just walk on and see something on the shelf and say, oh, wow, I got to have that game. Mm-hmm. And so we, we spent quite a bit of time trying to develop this whole new marketing channel to sell board games and family entertainment products. And both of them were, were just really hard. For some reason in the United States, we just couldn't get traction in the direct MLM selling model with parties. We couldn't get traction with Walmarts or Target or Barnes and Nobles, you, this is back in the early 2000s. Now you go into a Barnes and Noble or a Target, you'll see Catan. But that took 25 years to make that happen. So, so we were a little bit early in, in both of those businesses, I think. Mm. 
So with Simply Fun and Uber Play, then like, did you guys just start licensing a bunch of different games or you guys just picked what you thought would be best? Yeah. So we, we tried to pick what we thought would, would be best. Right. But you just never know what's going to hit. I think in Uber Play, we probably did 40 to 50 different board games and card games. Simply Fun is probably double that over the course of, of when I was there. But it's just really hard to have that kind of hit. Now, you got to remember, in the United States, if you have a game that sells 5,000 copies, that's considered really, really good in the hobby game market. Mm. And so by the time I realized how small the market was and how we couldn't break into the Targets or Walmarts, it just didn't make any money. It was super fun, really creative. I still have hundreds of board games in my house that I love to play, and but we couldn't make any money on it. And so with the Simply Fun business, the investor that we'd raised money from crammed everybody out, all the, the initial partners and founders. And, and so I ended up leaving that. And then Uber Play, I had a bunch of inventory sitting in a warehouse. And so I turned that into a new business opportunity, which is now Tanga where I actually started a daily deal company selling one board game every single day and to liquidate my inventory. So that's how Tanga started. <laughs> awesome. So you have this big warehouse and then you start putting these daily deals up. So how are you getting the traffic to those sites to be able to push these deals? So I kind of did the same thing I did with my V service company. I contacted a couple of individuals that I knew from my board game days, Scott Alden uh, with BoardGameGeek.com. And if you haven't looked at Board Game Geek, it's kind of a geeky website, not super well designed, especially back then, but just gets a huge amount of traffic. If you look at the Alexa ratings, it's pretty incredible. And so I contacted him and said, hey, can we partner up? I've got this new idea where we're going to sell these board games. And we came up with the idea of introducing Tanga in a kind of a unique way. And so his audience is very intellectual. They love puzzles. They love challenges. I mean, they're, they're board game geeks, right? And so we, we had my friend Aaron Weisblum, who's a board game designer, come up with all of these 30 days of, of these really hard puzzles that people would solve. And so we actually had a system where people could create an avatar. We had a community. A puzzle would go live every night at 7 o'clock. And all of these board game geeks would be pushed from boardgamegeek.com to tanga.com. And they would compete in solving these puzzles. And... After 30 days of puzzles, I think we had 30 or 40,000 users at that point, but they didn't know what Tanga was going to become. And then on the 31st day, we started releasing puzzles and something to buy. And so that's how we initially started the the traffic with Tanga. And it grew fairly quickly after that. Uh. And we continued the relationship with Board Game Geek for years, driving traffic to the website. Cool. So can we back that up a little bit? You said you had 30 days of puzzles and were you get, capturing like email addresses when they were like starting to take these? How did that work? Yep. Yeah. So we captured email addresses. So when they sign up to solve a puzzle, they had to give us, create an account basically. So we okay. we had information about each user. Okay. And then you said you built that up to about like 30,000 people. Is that right? Right. Yeah. In, in about 30 days. And so then we launched selling products and doing puzzles. And so eventually it became Tango was kind of like a YouTube of puzzles. Mm -hmm. And we had four or five different puzzle frameworks. We allowed users to create their own puzzles and then people would rate them and play them and solve them. And we had this whole Tango point system. I mean, that people could get points for solving puzzles or being first to solve a puzzle or how quickly they solved something. The points weren't worth anything. It was just kind of a scorekeeping mechanism. And so we, we were trying to grow both at the same time, the e-commerce side and the puzzle fun side. And eventually, the audience of non-puzzle users eclipsed the audience of these really hardcore gamers by 100 to 1. <laughs> and we just decided to, to remove that part of the business. It, yeah. I loved it. We still have all the data. I think we had 100,000 different puzzles and millions and millions of solves. Mm. And so eventually, maybe in, in another life, I'll re resurrect that. We've got some really cool ideas for that. So, But that's interesting. So you started going back towards your strengths of like, what are different like kind of assets we can create, like these puzzles that are going to get people engaged and involved and want to come to our site. That's right. Yeah. Doing something different. That's cool. So you generated a list of 30,000 people in 30 days. You guys are going to go out and start selling your board games. Like what happens next? So we started launching products. And so after board games, we got into some electronics and some other types of, of products. And eventually we realized that, hey, if you're only selling one product every day, if you don't have a good product at a good price point, your revenue is going to be zero for the 24 hours. And so it's not a great business model. And so we decided to open up new channels. We started selling magazines and jewelry and electronics and home goods and sports. 
eventually we would launch maybe five, six, seven different daily deals every single day. And then we decided that we were going to turn it into a real business. And so I started, that was up until this point, it was just me and a couple people running the business. How much revenue were you kind of at at that point? We were probably at two, two million maybe. Yeah, between one and two. Okay. You know, three years in. So when I decided to hire some of the old people that I worked with, like Matt Mullen, he's my CMO now, we started to really scale the revenue quickly. And really that scaling came from affiliate traffic. And so if your users don't know what affiliate traffic is in this uh, situation, we basically would have all these great daily deals that were best of web price points. You can't find it better anywhere else. So we would go to big affiliates like the big deal sites, Brad's Deal, Slick Deals, Fat Wallet, eBay, all the coupon sites, and basically say, hey, list our, our deals on your website, and then we will pay them a percentage of the transaction. So it's been a very good marketing channel for us. It's a lot harder now because the competition is so much harder, but we have really good relationships with our affiliates. We take them to dinner. Sometimes we travel with them. We meet them in, in Vegas and we, we just hang out and have fun. And we've, we've got really good relationships. It's something we do really well. Okay. So the, yeah, there's two sides to that. I love to hear like, how are you doing the outreach to get these new people? Or like, what are you saying? Like, Hey, here's, here's what we're going to do. And also like, how are you doing the outreach to get these deals where you're getting the best price on the web? Sure. So on the affiliate side, it really is going to affiliate conferences, reaching out on the phone, flying into their cities and meeting them face to face, creating those personal relationships. And so it it takes time and money and effort. It's not something that you're just going to be able to email someone and expect them to start listing your stuff. It just doesn't work that way. Because what you have, there's going to be 20 other people that have the exact same product, maybe even better price points. And so we've developed a relationship of trust with these guys. So when we send them something, they know we've done our homework. We have technology to make sure that the pricing is right and that we're best of web price point. It's a great deal. And we have social proof. And so they know that when they put products up from Tanga that they're going to sell and they're going to make some money. And so that's, that's how we've developed those relationships over time. In terms of the products that we get, we used to be a company that would purchase all the product, right? So we... We'd go and people would make us offers on overstocked items, electronics. And what we found is we weren't very good at determining how much to buy. And so we'd get stuck with lots of product in our warehouse. And then we'd have to really discount it and lose money on it. And so now really 95% of our business is from drop shippers. And so it's the same type of business model, but we never touch the product. People come to us and say, hey, we have a thousand of these headphones. We need to get rid of them. We'll negotiate a price point. We'll put them up on our website for 48 hours and then they'll ship them out for us or they'll ship it to our warehouse and we'll ship it out, depending on the deal. We used to do some manufacturing in China for jewelry and clothing and electronics. I mean, it's not a huge part of our business now. We will do it every once in a while, but it's just a lot easier to work with companies. And we work with thousands of companies that just drop ship for us. And these companies are located around the world. Mm, very interesting. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Okay, let's see here. So we had some other things that I wanted to run through with you. So I guess you said three years in, you got to 2 million. Were there any like major like milestones or like breakthroughs or like reasons why you're able to like scale up to 2 million? Yeah, it, it was expanding our product offering. Just doing one deal a day, we probably broke the million dollar mark. In order to really expand, you know, we had to offer more products every day. And so now we're a full fledged e commerce marketplace, right? We have millions of products on our website. And that has its own challenges as well in terms of people being able to find what they're looking for and making sure that people are uploading good pricing and things like that. But before 
really the the milestones were one we decided to kind of become more of a full featured web store or marketplace, and then two really opening up ourselves to different ways of marketing, affiliate being the prime way we grew our traffic very, very quickly. Okay. So affiliate, I know like email has been a big part of your business as well. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So email is is a big part of our business and continues to be so. But we're finding that email is becoming less and less effective over time. Mm. The unsubscribe rates and open rates are, are about the same, but it's getting harder and harder to get people to engage in email. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. One is younger people don't really spend a ton of time on email. So our email list is growing older in terms of demographic. And so those people continue to open up and purchase and click through. But the younger generation just just doesn't. In fact, my wife, you know, she's 40 and her email stopped working. So I looked at her promotion tab and it was like 20 gigabytes of unread email, right? And this is, this mm-hmm. is someone who loves to shop online, but she's just not looking at her email. And I think most younger people now, especially in their 20s and 30s, it's just not something that, that they do. Like they're being connected to on social media, on Snapchat, on Facebook, Instagram. You know, Facebook is probably skewing a little older, but that's been a challenge. But we're super good at email. Like we have really good systems and triggers and the ways to, to interact with our customers. It's just getting a little bit harder. So we have to look at other ways of, of reaching our customers now. Okay. So like, I think your business is probably like, it's harder for email just because like, you're just helping them with a deal and maybe it's a deals in specific areas versus another company where maybe there's more personal connection with them. So what do you do with your email to make it successful? Is it a lot of personalization where if like they ordered a puzzle, they're going to get a lot more puzzle offers? How does that work? We do. Yeah. We have what's called a customer dossier that we've built within our company. And so when you, let's say you come and order something on Tanga, I don't know if you ever have, if you haven't, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, we have a customer dossier on you, Jeremy, where all of a sudden we know so much about you just from information we scrape from publicly available sources. So we probably have your picture. We probably know where you went to school, what kind of interests and likes you have, probably your age, maybe even where you live, depending on what kind of information we were able to pull. And that's even if you don't even place an order. So, and then once you start clicking, searching, browsing, we collect all that information and we do create these subsets of what we feel you might have interest. And so when you come to Tango, we're hopefully doing a good job of putting the right products in front of you from a personalization standpoint, as well as emailing you the right information. Hmm. You may be really interested in refurbished MacBooks and hunting knives, but you have no interest in women's yoga pants. Well, you probably do have interest in women's yoga pants, <laughs> but not as far as like getting not to buy myself. Sale. Not to buy <laughs> exactly. So we try to create this personalization dossier and we've got some really cool technology to do some of that. Okay. So it sounds like some of that's like pretty like sophisticated with what you guys are doing. I think like people like these days you can do personalization, even just like some basic personalization. Absolutely. But what did you see when you started adding that in? How did that affect your like company? Yeah, it, it was a night and day difference of orders of magnitude, like 20, 30% increase in, in the amount of sales and click throughs that, that we got. And so it, it, that was a big jump for our company when we started implementing some of those personalization strategies. So the other thing that we're kind of toying with now is Facebook and Facebook Messenger. And what does that look like in terms of interacting with customers? So before companies like ours, let's say Overstock, they're willing to pay $100 for a customer. Right. So they'll go out and they'll spend a bunch of money on Google and keywords to try to bring in a customer because they feel the lifetime value of that customer over two years is going to be over a hundred bucks, but they can float that hundred dollars over two years. But what happens is what does that mean though? That well, that means you have an email address and that you can remarket to these customers. That means you own the customer. But now that email is becoming less and less effective, and pretty soon it may become completely ineffective, you really don't own your customers anymore. How do you then reach out and contact a customer? Well, you got to pay either Google or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat in order to remarket to the customers you just spent $100 for. So it's getting more and more expensive and hard to continue to reach your consumer who's supposed to come and, and buy product. And so there's two ways around that. One is you try to come up with new, unique ways of reaching them through like Messenger, for example, which we do and we're trying to perfect. Or you build a strong enough brand that you just become this known entity in their mind where they can just come in and type tanga.com. That's really hard to do, right? Super hard. And we've done some of that with some of the small business messaging 
but it, it's harder and harder, I think, when you spend a lot of money to acquire a customer. It's almost like you, you have to just make money on that first acquisition and that first sale and be profitable on that first sale mm-hmm. because it's just so expensive to retarget these people, in which we do. So when we're doing SEM or we're doing Google shopping, we actually are profitable on the first sale. So because you know, we bootstrapped this thing, we don't have a ton of cash, we can't just project out a year and hope that these customers become profitable. Okay. And do you have any like advice or strategies around that, around like becoming profitable on that first purchase? Well, affiliate. So affiliate, if you price your uh, affiliate commissions correctly, it's all paper action, right? So you're not paying them, but you can. There are affiliate programs out there where you can pay for traffic or pay per click. Mm-hmm. Really, you're paying for an action, you're paying for a sale. And so all of our sales through affiliate are profitable. So that's a very good way of growing a business if you don't have any money. Now, the other ways, let's say you do retargeting. So you might use um, AdRoll or Steelhouse. Somebody, like even Google now, mm-hmm. right, has their own retargeting platform. You just make sure that your ROAS on that is high enough with your margins that you're able to make money on any acquisition that comes in, right? So even if you just break even, you're hoping that you can somehow touch that customer again through email or, or through retargeting some way that when they come back, they purchase something that, that might drive a little bit of margin. I want to ask you a follow-up question. Okay. You guys did affiliate and that was a great strategy to get in without having like a bunch of money up front or without having traffic. Right. When you guys got into paid traffic, how long did it take you to make that work? Were you guys profitable like immediately or were there some things you had to do? It was a couple months. You know, you're always going to take a few months, I think, of trial and error. We do pretty well with SEM and, and Google Shopping. And you know, Google Shopping is a little bit tricky because it is pretty technical. I mean, even for our company, sometimes we just scratch our head about how technical they make it and how hard they make it. But if you do it right, you can make some money on it. And so, so that's a profitable way of advertising for us right now. We have yet to figure out how to break into just normal Facebook advertising and make it profitable. So if there's anybody out there that thinks they can help me with that, reach out to me. Okay. All right. We'll put your information up in the show notes as well. All right. A couple like things I want to cover with you. Were there any times like in, in any of these businesses we've talked about where you thought like you were going to fail? And if so, like what did you do to turn things around? Yeah. On the V server part, I think it's by the end of 1999, we were starting to see slower growth and we started to see the bubble. And so people were talking about stock market crashes. I mean, I was young. I was 27. I, I didn't know anything about how the stock market works or how equity can just be completely closed shut with, with the big crash. And, and so we were running out of server space. We had to figure out where to lease new server space. We were running out of office space, so we were ready to sign a big lease, like a 50,000 square foot lease in downtown Bellevue. And so we had all of these expenses coming up. We were bootstrapping the company. And all of a sudden, we started to see these markets, uh, financial markets start to close up. And so just by chance, we were able to sell the company. And we sold at the end of December of 1999, and the stock market crashed, what, two months later or something like that. So if we didn't hit that, I think our company would have been in a world of hurt. Wow. But we started to see that coming down the, down the pipeline. With Tenga, sure. I mean, it's one, well, let's go back to the board game companies. You know, we saw after trying to do board games for three years, we knew it just, it wasn't going to produce a, a real business, right? At least during that time frame, I think times have changed a little bit now with uh, access to these types of consumers. But we just knew that it would be a hard road to continue. So we just kind of pivoted the Uber Play business, took the inventory and started Tenga. And Tenga, yeah. The first three years, I was running it as a hobby. I wasn't making any money at it. I actually tried to sell the company. I had a couple of people interested in buying it for just pennies. But then I was talking to my buddy, Matt, and he said, you know, you could actually turn this into a real business and brought him down to Phoenix. And we actually turned it around. You know, cash flow, when you're a bootstrap company like ours, is always difficult. So we're always trying to manage cash flow really tightly. And we're at the point now where we're actually trying to raise some money within Tanga to help us with some some new technology that we're developing that could be really, really cool that we'll have to get on another podcast here after we launch it and talk about it. So, Sure. Awesome. Well, you brought this up a couple of times. So like, why don't we talk about or share your experience, Jeremy, on the difference between bootstrapping and raising money and when you think is the right time for each of those? Sure. So it obviously, it just depends. For me, I've done both. And for the most part, I like the bootstrap mentality because I'm in control. Our employees are in control of our own destiny. We don't have investors or Wall Street telling us what we need to do with our company. When I sold my web hosting company, all of a sudden we were a publicly traded company. And we went from controlling our own destiny, 
doing whatever we wanted to basically having Micron come in and change every HR policy and tighten everything down and had to report to the street. And every quarter, the CEO would come in from Boise, Idaho and say, okay, now everything's changed. We're going after dedicated web hosting. And then the next quarter would be like, forget dedicated web hosting. The street wants application server processing. And I mean, it was just every single quarter, it was something different. And being a 27-year-old, I had no idea what to even do with myself in that situation. It pretty much sucked. And I negotiated my way out of it mm. and started the board game companies. But when you raise money, you're at the mercy of the investor. And so if you have an investor that wants to be involved in everything and make all the decisions. And I felt like a lot of times I was spending three weeks out of the month getting ready for investor meetings and a month and a week on the business when it should be working two months plus three months on really driving the business and then maybe a couple of days on investor presentations. And so for me, it's always been, I like to bootstrap businesses because I like the control. Yes, I could raise a bunch of money and try to moonshot this thing but I could lose my business, right? If I don't hit these lofty goals that I've set or expectations, investors, if they have too much control, can come in and take your company away from you. But sometimes that's the type of moonshot you need to do in order to achieve your goals and dreams because the business requires a bunch of capital. So I think we're at a good position now where we have a pretty decent sized business for bootstrapping. I mean, everyone tells us that they can't believe we've done it without any money. And so now raising money to kind of help us with this new technology we're developing, it puts us in a good position because I don't think we have to give up as much control. We'll try to find investors that really love the vision, know that I've done this multiple times, and hopefully just gives us access to help and money that we can kind of reach our goals without having to be managed a lot. Okay, awesome. And then I think the last thing we're kind of going to talk about for this episode was your thoughts or opinions on like hiring with, you know, the right culture fit as that's been like an issue in your company. Right. Yeah. So Culture is a big, big issue. You get the wrong people in certain positions and you can see your culture and the way that people think about your your company, the way that they act with inside the company. You get a couple of really negative people that start to spread gossip and just complain all the time. You can lose your company very quickly by having those types of people in your organization. And so for us, we would much rather hire culturally, even people who don't have the skill set. We feel like sometimes we could teach the skill set. You can't teach the right culture. It really doesn't exist. If you don't have the right personalities in place, it's almost impossible to teach. Some people in our company, we tried and tried to teach the culture and get them to be more friendly and get them to be more transparent and get them to work as a team. And it was just always these back channels of bickering and fighting and backstabbing. You know, those types of people will kill your company. And so hire slow, fire fast. I know that people say that all the time, but you can fire over cultural issues. If they don't fit your culture, get rid of them. Find someone that does because like I said, it can really, really harm your company. I've seen it firsthand. Yeah. And then so to make sure you're screening the right people, are you just asking questions around the core values or do you have some other ideas for for how to hire the right people? Yeah. So spend a lot of time with them individually, like take them out to dinner don't just interview them for half an hour and expect to know. Really contact their references and not just work references, but personal references, direct report references. And I know that's hard sometimes because a lot of people don't want to give out information that might damage somebody. But you have to be super thorough, right, of what kind of people they are and what types of situations. And so go through scenarios of your core values of what you expect and have them share stories of how they have reacted in certain situations. Because if you get someone like, let's say, you know, we're a culture of honest and open communications, but treating each other like family. Well, then you get people who are very honest and open in communications, but they just ramrod everybody and cause all these internal conflict and not treat people like family and friends. Then they aren't living up to that core value. And it just kind of throws a monkey wrench into the whole system. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a small team. We have 35 employees. So everyone has to work together and it's got to be super transparent. It's got to be lots of communication. Everyone has to act like the CEO of their position. And if they aren't, they just not a good fit here. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, we're getting close to like the end of our episode here. So a couple quick questions for you. Jeremy, what's the one thing you did that had the biggest impact on your growth? On the Tenga side, there's two things. It was implementing a full-on affiliate marketing strategy, as well as creating a really good system for email. So we use Salesforce. It was the exact target for sales. Salesforce bought them. It's very expensive but we were able to do some amazing things with triggers and personalization through the email system that really helped us jumpstart growth. 
Okay. And then if you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? Oh boy. I would probably tell myself to become a sommelier. <laughs> Do something in wine. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. Other than that, you know, know when to get out, I think is a big thing that a lot of entrepreneurs don't really think about that often. So a lot of times there's just a time to get out of the business. There's a time to just say, okay, I've done what I can do. It's time to sell the business, partner with someone, move on, try other things. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs just kind of feel like they've got to get to that next level, right? Well, I'm doing 1 million. I have to get to five before I sell this. Well, you may never get to five because you don't, that, you know, the business may not support it or you're just, you're not the type of manager that can get it there. So know what your limits are and get out when you should be getting out. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for jumping on with us, Jeremy. If people want to find out more about you or connect with you, where's the best place to go? Tanga.com is my website, T-A-N-G-A or Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-Y at Tanga.com. Awesome. And we'll throw those in the show notes for people as well. Cool. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for jumping on today. You obviously have had a ton of experience and I really appreciate you sharing with us and our audience how you did it. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more or hear previous episodes, you can go to blog.leadquizzes.com. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a 14-day free trial to Lead Quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Please also subscribe to our show on Apple or however you get your podcasts. You can also write us at support at leadquizzes.com. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.